I don't know. Okay, look, I guess it doesn't say that on here. Okay, so um, what we're going to do today is I'll make some notes on modifications to cloud.safemath in the last very long day. Um, and then I'll talk about the surprise topic of the day is 3D graphics. So that's what we're going to do. Okay. What to get rid of this title bar, or no. are you worried that this still won't work? You're right, I do, because otherwise it's just going to be me. Yeah. Nobody wants to see that. Okay, <laughs> so thank you. Screen share. Um, huh? I don't know. I guess I don't know. Maybe this one or this. Oh. I don't know. Yeah, because that's probably everything. Yeah, that's what I want. Maybe it's right. <laughs> There's no way to tell because the second I switch. Oh, OK. All right, thank you. All right, so first topic is uh, the changes made to cloud.sagemath yesterday. Um, so first, it, the Sage version is upgraded, which means there's a few small changes to Sage. Uh, secondly, I rewrote a bunch of stuff and improve snapshotting quite a bit. Um, so now, basically, when the way I'd implemented it before, uh, which was the minimal thing I could do, when you browsed the list of snapshots of a project, it would potentially depend on which uh, server you happen to connect to. So that would be potentially very confusing. You could hit refresh and see a different list of snapshots. Now all the snapshots are merged together in one single list. Um, the second thing is, the actual browsing is a lot snappier, and that's because of more caching and uh, the code that computes the like list of files in a given directory in a snapshot is um, cached and done in a completely different way. So there's a lot more that's done there. Um, also, you'll see there's quite a lot of snapshots, so I divided them up first by day. So for example, if you look at this project, and then uh, that, go to snapshots, they're divided up by day, which makes it easier to view them. If you click on, for example, today, then you see a list of the snapshots. And basically, the times there are the times I was working in this particular project. So for example, at some point, I went to lunch, and there's no nothing. Um, but in the morning, I was preparing lecture or giving a lecture. OK, there's a lot of them, because uh, they get taken on average every 30 seconds or so. And then when you click here, you see like the most recent snapshot as before. It's just that they're divided up into days first, which I think is useful. Um, there it is. And now if you do exit and then go and look at the same one again, it's cached for, I think, one day, so it's a lot faster to look at that listing. OK. Uh, and by the way, it's potential. I plan, but obviously I'm not going to just do it instantly. Um, in the snapshots, you have a list of kind of all the times you've been working on a given project. So it would be nice to have this displayed in like a timeline view. So you would see a timeline for the day, and then it would have some dots right around where you were working a lot. And you could click there to zoom in and get your snapshots at that time and see what files changed and so on. But that's for later. Um, I don't know if anybody else saw it, but I noticed a bug often in the terminal for me where the bottom line would be cut off sometimes at certain zoom levels. Um, you did see that? OK. I don't know if it was a bug in my version of Chrome or everybody saw it, but I fixed it. And it turned out, in case you're curious, the issue is that uh, the way I figured out the height of a line in the terminal was by getting the first line and asking for its height. Sometimes the lines, they should have constant height, you would think. But due to subtle rounding errors in browsers, they don't. So now what the code does is it, it gets all the lines of the terminal and then takes the maximum of the heights. Yes? Uh, I think paste works, but copy doesn't work. Yeah, there's some weird things with copying and pasting. And it says highlight the text and select it, but it's a highlight and I can't select it. But I can't. Uh, when, yeah. when did you have that happen? Um, actually, that was when I was working on the last assignment. So. When? Um, that was last week. Because uh, that's a bug. I mean, there was the, exactly that bug which I fixed, but it was something I fixed like a, two if you, weeks if you ago. If you copying something from the terminal, uh, you might see it. Or it you may not. So I think it's uh, good now. I did. There was exactly that bug, um, 
but I fixed it a while ago. That said, if you're using cloud.sagemath.org instead of .com, the yeah. server I set up initially, I haven't applied any bug fixes or made any changes to that since I set it up. Because I, I would encourage Kong. everyone to, what? I'm using Kong. Okay, good, so that's not a problem. Um, is it, are you using Windows as your client? Windows, yeah. Okay, I haven't done much testing on Windows as a client, but I'm not aware of any situations where you can't do copy and paste. Although exactly the problem you mentioned was a problem about two weeks ago, I think. Okay. So one thing is um, it's important to refresh your browser occasionally. Uh, I haven't written code to force a browser refresh. So you can be running old JavaScript code. If you don't refresh your browser, it can be cached. And when I make improvements, for example, to the terminal, it's really to a program that runs in your browser written in JavaScript. And if you don't refresh your browser, you might not see those changes. Um, usually the browser will just automatically refresh when things are uh, updated, but sometimes they don't. And it's not really it's difficult to control. Uh, OK, so but the, the zoom level issue is now fixed. And basically what would happen is, for example, if you're in an editor and you had certain characters, the top few lines would be, would be skinnier than the other lines. So I just grab all the lines and then take the maximum. Except that didn't work either because every once in a while it'll be one line that's like twice as tall or something ridiculous just because of weird browser stuff. So I throw out outliers. But, um, I don't know. It's, it even works if you zoom in in all kinds of funny ways and stuff. OK, um, Haskell and Routgit are now installed, but not all documentation for Haskell because it's like 800 megabytes if you install all that. And I don't have the space yet. So I'm just curious, like, how do you install um, I mean, the entire working environment? On I installed the GHC, like the GNU Haskell, or Glasgow Haskell compiler. Yeah. But uh, I haven't installed much more. And then Racket, I just did app git install Racket. So, um, so if I was to like, um, give a declaration of Haskell. If you were to write a, like a file, if you had uploaded a file or something written in one of those languages and wanted to compile it or get the interpreter for a racket, I guess, there's one, then you could do so now in the terminal at least. So you just so. install the compiler? Yeah. So if you want to build Haskell code, like edit it in a file and then be able to build it in the terminal, you can do that. Yeah. I think. I don't know. I haven't used it. I just installed it. Um, Sage, so you can now have any copy of Sage you want run in a worksheet, which was the feature that you had requested. Um, what you have to do, all I did in order to enable this um, is make it so that, well, there's two things I added. One, I made it so that the directory bin in your home directory, so I'll denote that by dollar home bin, if that's a common way of writing this in Unix, but just means bin in the top of your project. Any program you put there, well, basically before the Sage server's set to run, this is added to the path. And when the Sage server runs, it uses whatever program is called Sage. So if you just put a script that runs Sage in your bin directory, then it will get run for the Sage server. So as an example of that, just so you can see what it looks like, uh, what you would do is go to your root direct to the home directory, and in bin, you would put a link to a copy of Sage. So uh, you make a file like that. And this is something, since you have to make a symbolic link, you'd really need to do it from the terminal. So you go into your bin directory and you type ln-s, and then you give um, the path to a copy of Sage, which might be something like that. Dot. So that's exactly what you would type right there. Um, and once you do that, then whenever the Sage server for this particular project starts up, it will use that copy of Sage instead. So if you want to use like Sage 5.9 with certain changes that you've made or Sage 5.10 beta 2 or whatever random copy of Sage, all you have to do is just uh, get it into cloud and then extract it, build it, and uh, make whatever changes you want, and then you can do this. And then when you start new worksheets, they'll use that copy of Sage. But they would all use it. Yes, all they will all use it, path. all in that project. Okay. Yeah, if you want to use other uh, copies of Sage, just make another project, and you can. Um, also, after you add a Sage script to your bin directory, uh, what you would do, so it's right here. In the project settings, I added a button right here called Restart Project Server. What this will do, uh, in your 
in the account corresponding to your project, there's a couple of servers that are running that your, your um, browser is talking to. And this will just restart all of them. In particular, it restarts the Sage server. And so all of your Sage worksheets will use that new server. Um, so you can click on this button. It takes about 15 seconds. And it completely, cleanly restarts everything. Also, if you're having really, really weird issues or something, that might help. Although I've never, it's mainly something when you make changes to your environment. Or you can specifically restart only the Sage worksheet server by clicking right here where it says restart worksheet server. Um, so for example, if you, right now, when the Sage server started up, it used the system-wide Sage. If I were to add a link like that and try to run the Sage that uh, is in that directory, then I'd have to click this. And then new worksheets would use that copy of Sage. An existing worksheet, you'll have to stop um, Sage running in it. So for example, in this worksheet, I click on this red button, and this will stop the copy of Sage that's running. And then when it restarts, when you do something in the worksheet, then it'll use the new version of Sage. So it's not perfect, but it is certainly possible to use this to change the version of Sage that you're using. But in short, to people that know a little bit of Unix, the directory dollar home bin is in your path. And the Sage server, when it starts initially, it just runs Sage and imports. It just runs the copy of Sage that's in your path, which, if you put a link to that copy of Sage in bin, will thus be in your path. OK? Um, I mean, in case you're curious, when the, the way the Sage server is started up is there is a file right here in the, direct, the hidden directory sage math cloud called start sage, or start, actually called sage server. And what it does is it uh, runs sage, and it runs it with that file as input sage underscore server dot py. And if this sage is your sage, then it will work, and that will be the case. Um, because when this particular script is run, it is in the URL path. OK? So if you want to demo something and use a custom version of Sage, it's possible. Um, let's see. There are a couple of other changes. So when plotting, I don't know if you ever noticed it, but when you first draw a plot in a worksheet, it will take sometimes five seconds. Has anyone ever noticed it being kind of slow? The reason is because it's importing a bunch of libraries to do plotting. And because of the way the Sage server program that uh, I have there works, you can actually just pre-import whatever you want. And then each time a worksheet starts, it forks off from that process that has everything set up already. And so I just added something so that it pre-imports the plotting code and hence now, the first time you draw a plot, it's, it's essentially instantaneous, rather than waiting that time. So instead of that time happening every single time you start a new worksheet, it, start, it happens only once when the Sage server starts, which is a very rare thing to have happen. Um, and then after that, you uh, always get that time sort of for free. If you reset your project server, yep. will that then make it happen? Yep. But in fact, the project server reset takes about 15 seconds. And it takes 15 seconds even if it wasn't doing this. There's absolutely no time that gets wasted because of this. So um, if I were to go reset worksheet or reset project server, I'll just do it. So it spins a little thing, tells you it's going to take about 15 seconds. And then in about 15 seconds, hopefully it will say it's done and succeeded. Hopefully. Come on, come on. It did it. Or so it claims. Um, but it, it displays this message uh, in response to successfully having restarted it. And um, I mean, I guess at this point, the there was a worksheet, there was a process behind this worksheet, a Python process that was running, and that thing's been killed. So it might even be wise to close the worksheet and reopen it. Um, and now if I go to the top, say, and do plot sign. There. See how it was very quick after I um, dealt with it. So the, the funny, like, crazy text for a second is because the process, it's complicated, but basically the process 
corresponding to the worksheet got killed when the server got restarted, and certain other things along the chain have to realize that that's been killed and reset themselves. I just haven't written the code to make it appear prettier. Um, and it just sort of like exposes its underlying codes for a second. That will get fixed. OK, so that's, uh, oh, and there was one other bug somebody, I found with somebody, which was um, file name extensions are, were determined only correctly when the file name was lowercase. So if you clicked on a .jpg file, for example, and the jpg was uppercase, then it would try to download and edit the underlying raw binary file in the code in your editor, which would be very bad if the file was large, instead of just displaying the file. Um, so I fixed that. OK. Um, the topic that we'll talk about today is 3D graphics using Sage. And this is a somewhat painful thing to talk about in cloud.sagemath right now because of the following reason. Make this bigger. Well, because Java is not popular anymore, or at least Java applets aren't. So um, I'll describe in a slide near the bottom, assuming we get there, uh, the history of 3D graphics in Sage, and something about how many different people contributed and where all the code came from. Um, but suffice to say that, ooh, actually, uh, who knows? I don't know whether Java works in this browser. On my laptop, there's no Java applets. It's, it's a Chromebook. Um, there are a lot of computers that people use the internet through these days, which Java applets are frowned upon. Um, and 3D graphics display in Sage, in the Sage notebook at least, is uses Java applets to display a 3D image and make it so you can rotate it around and so on. Um, so using my laptop, there's no way I can even show you that. But actually, I don't know, maybe Java applets work here. So if they do, OK, that would be fine. So I'll show a 3D graphic in a minute that you can rotate around. At least I'll have that ready to go. <clears throat> Uh, so right now, when you use cloud.sagemath, 3D graphics are displayed statically. So they're an image. You can't rotate them around, but otherwise you can look at them. And there's also no access. There's no way to add text to 3D images. Um, otherwise, they work fine. It's just you can't rotate them around, which is kind of important for getting a good feeling for what a 3D graphic looks like. Um, there's going to be a Sage workshop here at UW, June 17th through 21st. Bunch of coding sprints, fairly small. I think it's going to be in Savory Hall. Well, lots of snacks. And if anybody here wants to come and work on coding Sage for a couple of days, check out this website. It's just a link to from wiki.sagemath.org. Huh, that sucks. Jason, your Sage cell server is not as robust as it should be. There it is. Hmm. OK, so uh, one nice fact about 3D graphics in the Sage Notebook is basically things are pretty mature, and almost everything's implemented except a modern way of looking at 3D graphics, <laughs> which is kind of silly. But um, back in the old days, as you'll see in the story about where this all came from, you know, there's no, we had no idea Java applets were going to not be super popular and everything in 2013. And if they were, then the situation would be a little bit different. OK, so first I'm going to give you a tour of available functionality for 3D plotting, and then some history and something about what we'll do next. There's the warning I just made. Oh, another warning. So if you make a 3D plot, it's a graphics object very much like a 2D plot, except it's called graphics 3D instead of graphics. Uh, one thing, though, is it has a show method, and in cloud.sagemath it won't do anything at all. Just, just completely ignore it. Whereas show of the graphic will work fine. Uh, the reason for this is that I can't so-called monkey patch um, Cython code. And g, g this is an instance of some Cython class. So uh, it's not possible to change the behavior of g.show in Sage currently without modifying the actual copy of Sage itself at compile time which I don't want to do because I want to make it easy for somebody to take any version of Sage and just download it, put it into Sage Cloud, and run it, and have their worksheets run through it, for example, which wouldn't be possible if it's necessary to patch the hell out of the Sage library in order to use that copy of Sage with the uh, notebook. OK, so here's the first example, a sphere. It's really easy to make a sphere. 
as you can see. You just say sphere and then you say show it. And in, assuming we have Java working, I might be able to do that over here. I have to see. You do not have Java applets enabled. So I guess maybe there's no Java in Chrome. Um, maybe you have it in a different browser. I don't know. So it used to be that when we set things up to use what we used here, that this was a less common message than it is today. OK. This is a static image. So it's just an image, like a PNG image. If you go open link in new tab, you'll see that. Uh, except, yeah, open image in new tab. See, it's just something.png. Um, the disadvantage is you can't rotate around. The one advantage, though, is you can very easily right-click on it, save it somewhere, and then put it in a paper or a web page or something like that. That's a dubious advantage because um, if you had a proper renderer, you could rotate it to be just like you want and then do a screenshot, which would be just as good or better because you could make it bigger or something. But uh, I'll try to sell it that way anyways as an advantage. It's not. Uh, oh, well, one advantage of it, though, is that it, at least you can view this on anything. Like if you pull up the same page on, your, on any, any reasonably modern phone or anything else, it'll certainly be able to view. 3D image. Okay, here's an example of a plot of a function of two variables, which is the sort of thing you do a lot in, or maybe calculus. You want to do maybe some integral that involves 4x e to the minus x squared minus y squared. So you might want to look at the function and see what it looks like. And there you are. So here's an example of plotting a function. It's completely straightforward. It's just like the normal plot command, except it's plot 3D. And instead of one variable, you get two variables, two ranges. And there's a whole bunch of options, just like with the 2D plotting command, involving where, how many plot points it chooses, how it does refinement, um, what colors it uses, et cetera, et cetera, whether it should draw a little grid on the surface. There's a million different options there. Um, here's just another example. This illustrates, so this next example illustrates how you combine together different figures or images in one. It's exactly like with 2D plotting. So you can make a 3D plot, P. This is a 3D graphics object, just like before. You can do the same with Q. And just like with 2D graphics, if you want to superimpose the two, you use plus. And that combines them into a single plot. There's the plot. And the reason that you can kind of see through uh, one of these is because of the, opac the opacity argument. And the reason it's red is because color equals red. If I could rotate it around and so on, with the Java outlet, you'd be able to see it. I'll just have to imagine that. Sorry. Okay, here's an overview of 3D plotting functionality. So if I click, um, there's a, sec a chapter of the reference manual. It's about 3D graphics. Here it is. And you can see that there's various sections for different types of um, plotting functionality. And I've just gone through and divided them up. Um, so there's a bunch of functions for making complete objects that are 3D solids, like um, where they're really kind of the outside. But tetrahedron, so the standard platonic solids. And then you can make a sphere, and you can make a general 3D polygon. Um, for each of these, once you make the object, there's also methods for rotating and translating it if you want to. So for example, if we take. Um, well, there's a ton to show you here, but let me just move up for a second. If we take and make a, I don't know, which, which platonic solid do you want to see? OK, dodecahedron. So you make a dodecahedron. OK, so I'll just call it G. Now, right when you make it, there's a whole bunch of options you can pass, for example, to control the color, and um, opacity, and so on. But let's not do any of that. Um, let's just first do this. So it's a graphics 3D object, and uh, it has methods like, well, I'll just do g.tab. But in particular, note there's methods like rotating around various axes, the x, y, or z axis, or just rotating around an arbitrary axis. There's also a translate um, option right there. So if you want to take a dodecahedron and then another dodecahedron, maybe a whole bunch of them, and move them around, and rotate them in funny ways, and so on, and put them together in the same scene, all you have to do is repeatedly call, just make your dodecahedron. It has a size option where you can scale it. You can then translate or rotate it however you want, and then use plus to keep adding it into some scene. 
So you can very, very easily set up a complicated scene with all the platonic solids all over the place and so on. And then you can render it using uh, well, the ray tracer I just showed you. There are some other ways of rendering. Um, but uh, for example, there's some uh, output formats for rendering uh, like X3D. One of the student projects, I think three years ago, the students took a whole bunch of nice plots from the documentation, output them using the X3D format, and then printed them on a 3D printer in their lab, which was kind of cool. And then they gave them to me. and didn't know what to do with them. But OK, so that's how you can make complicated scenes very easily out of these mathematical style primitives. Uh, maybe I should do some non-trivial examples. So G plus G translated by uh, 100. Zero, zero. So I'll just show that. So it should show two dodecahedrons. And there we are. See? Uh, one good thing about this ray tracer, by the way, that's being used to draw the static images is that it's very fast. Um, it if you have a computer with multiple cores, it runs in parallel efficiently to build the ray tracing. Um, and I'm going to set, I kind of want this to be transparent so you can see through it. See, I made it transparent, and now you can see through it a little bit. Okay. All right, so that's uh, solids. And then just to give you a quick overview, I'm going to show you a couple of examples of the others. Um, there's various plotting. There's like implicit 3D plotting, which I'll show you some examples of. List plotting is extremely useful if you have a bunch of data, that, like a bunch of points in three-dimensional space, and want to see a nice surface that interpolates between them. And this behind the scenes will call uh, configurably one of many different interpolation routines that are in SciPy, and then draw a, a nice picture and you can configure how many points it should add in, and so on. So it's actually something people care a lot about in the numerical computation. Um, parametric plotting, so you can draw a curve that goes through space given by some functions or a surface. 3D plotting, I already showed you that. And then some other things for drawing surfaces of revolution, things described by spherical coordinates, et cetera. Finally, uh, there's a couple of things related to points and lines. So you can draw a three-dimensional arrow. Uh, Bezier's spline in three-dimensional space, a line, which is really a sequence of line segments all connected together. Uh, so if you want to draw a three-dimensional uh, Brownian motion looking thing, then you can make the line be random, make a random walk with three dimensions, which looks cool. Um, parametric plot again, uh, vector fields, and 3D text using text 3D. This doesn't work in the uh, ray trace render, but it works everywhere else. So. It's a little bit annoying. One other thing you can do is if you have a 2D plot sitting there in the plane, if you call dot plot 3D on it, it turns it into a 3D plot, which you can then transform around, translate, rotate, etc. So if you can draw something in a plane and you want to stick it into your 3D plot, you could do so by calling the plot 3D method on it. This doesn't work for every possible 2D plot, but it works for a lot of them. And it's a lot of work because what uh, the person who wrote that did was go through and for every single 2D plotting primitive, made a way of rendering it in 3D, which is totally different. Um, so here's a little example to illustrate some of all the platonic solids. So um, all I did was loop through the platonic solids, throw in some colors in some cases, and display them. And there you are. It's just a bunch of little images, and the browser just sort of puts them in the line. Um, here's one that, so what this does is it makes a random polygon. Uh, you have to read the docs to see exactly how a bunch of vertices define a polygon, but more or less it's supposed to define faces. So if you set some sort of opacity so that the faces are transparent, and then just put a whole bunch of random points in a cube, then you'll just see something random looking, which looks like me doing origami. Um, and you can change the you know, number of points or whatever. And the color. So like that. 
um, implicit plots. So these often look really pretty. And uh, just, I mean, I got some of these examples from implicit plot, the documentation, the reference manual. I actually wrote the, this page of the reference manual. And I got it mainly by saying, hey, we have some 3D plotting in Sage. Can anybody send me nice examples? And David Joyner found a whole bunch of really pretty examples. Um, and I guess he was doing it right before Valentine's Day, since there's a reference to that here. OK, so here's an example. I, I've showed you this one before. Uh, but this is a 3D implicit plot, as you can see. And this one, so what happens is it takes that function p, and it evaluates it at some number of points in each direction, the x, y, and z direction, and then uh, figures out where it's close to zero, and then fills in a surface that goes through all those points. And it just somehow cleverly, it, it's kind of like two steps. One is uh, evaluating the function at a bunch of points. The second is drawing something that looks like it goes through all those points. And um, this, the code, so we had nothing to do implicit 3D plotting in Sage, and then a guy named Carl Witte, who uh, worked at a place that did computer vision down in Renton, uh, just like an engineer there, got interested in Sage because he wanted to write a provably correct screensaver. And I kid you not, um, unfortunately, he eventually wrote the screensaver, and then we haven't heard of him since. But um, he just, you know, like for him, figuring out how to draw a surface that goes through a bunch of points, implementing an algorithm to do that wasn't particularly hard because it's sort of part of his expertise as a computer vision engineer. Um, so he did that, but the code is sort of like two thirds of the way done. He didn't want to deal with the Sage referee process and only, you know, it didn't work in certain cases. And then uh, Bill Calchoice, who's an undergrad here, finished it off and got it into Sage and dealt with a lot of edge cases. So that's why we have this. Um, but it's a good example of code where uh, it wasn't something where you could just grab some existing open source library and have it. We had to write it ourselves. Um, here's another of the many, many examples on that page. A Klein bottle or not. Hey, give me a Klein bottle. OK, there it is. Um, I've set some opacity. It's just some parameter. It's some uh, function that apparently describes a Klein bottle. So there's. And notice, I guess this is a looking at it, this is an algebraic function. So this is the plot of the real points instead of an algebraic curve. So if you do algebraic geometry and you ever want to see <coughs> what the objects you're studying look like, at least projected down a three-dimensional space, implicit plot 3D may be handy. And also, in algebraic geometry, we often we'll study things like curves that are described by intersecting two surfaces in three-dimensional space. And with this opacity option um, and implicit plotting, you can plot both of those curves and then have them together in the same scene. And then you can see where they intersect visibly, which is nice. OK, if you're a data person, then you probably care a lot about list plots. So um, I've made up, so the data I'm considering is uh, the so points so in the ij in the xy position it's sine of x squared plus y squared so I have a whole bunch of um, points so this is a six by six matrix of real numbers and list plot 3D one of the input types it can take is a matrix so you have a bunch of data say a bunch of points that are supposed to that you somehow want to visualize in space and this will let you do it and here you are. Um, so this is what it looks like. But the cool thing is that you can increase the number of sample points and interpolate. And I'll show you that in the next frame. So this is basically the same, except I've changed the interpolation type. And I've increased the number of sample points. And you can see what that looks like. So there you are. So you can imagine how this could be useful if you had any data. I don't know. It's the sort of thing that. I've never once used, but when we have our like booth about Sage, people will walk up left and right and they'll be like, I have a bunch of points in space and I need to draw a surface through them. And I'm like, why? What? But it's like super common. I don't know. Um, are there any like ACMS majors that would ever want to do this sort of thing here?
you want to see how to plot anything? Any of the functions? Did any function that went by look interesting to you? And you want to see an example? I will not proceed until somebody requests an example. Yeah. What? Yeah. Direct delta. Uh, that's a that's a function of one variable, not two. Okay. Monkey saddle. Monkey saddle. How to, uh, okay, so that is. Wasn't that just one of the examples here? <laughs> Oops. Hmm. No. I'm hoping it's an example here. Otherwise, we'll have to. Um, nope. For a dog. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so Wikipedia page, it'll give us. Okay, so here's the equation. So to plot that, what do we do? We want to draw a plot like that, and we don't have whatever program made that beautiful plot, and we want to do it in cloud. What do we do? Which of the functions I showed you do you think you'd want to use? Yep, exactly, plot3D. That would work fine. So x cubed minus 3xy squared, we'll use plot3D. Plot3D. Um, we have to define the variables, x and y. And now I already forgot the equation. So x cubed minus 3xy squared. And now say what range of x and y values we want. Uh, I don't know, but I'll just go minus. Often I'll do this because I don't know. And then I'll fill in b, various values of b until it looks good. And now, whoops, uh, your key word is different than mine, so hold on. So I'll do show that, and there we are. So that doesn't look good enough yet. Maybe I'll try a bigger value of b. That might be way too big. Or small. Or value. Huh. Makes very little difference. I guess it's rescaling one of the axes. So, jeez. Surprised how little difference that makes. Okay, well, there's your monkey saddle. Enjoy. Okay, so now let me give you the uh, history. See how quick I should be? Yep, all right. So the five-minute history of Sage 3D plotting. Here it is. Okay, so first there was nothing. We had no 3D plotting. So we were the mockery of Mathematica and Maple with their amazing 3D plotting where they thought that was the most important thing in math software. Um, I didn't care because I wrote Sage mainly to be a competitor to Magma, and Magma has no plotting at all, so we need 3D plotting, but people teaching really wanted it. Um, 2006 Matplotlib, which you can draw, you can use all of Matplotlib from Sage and inside of Sage, they added fake, icky, static 3D graphics. Um, I had some talks with the people there about this. Basically, they just uh, wrote some class that derived from 2D graphics, but would draw 3D graphics called mplot3d. It's still in there, and it's actually gotten a lot better over the years. But um, it, from an object-oriented point of view, it violates the is a relationship, where when you derive from a class, the instances of the derived class sh should satisfy an is a relationship with the base class. And that's not, 3D graphs are not 2D graphs. So that led to a lot of weird code and confusion. We stared at it for a while and tried to use it, but it just didn't seem, well, they had no plan at all for making something that was dynamic, and um, that seemed to be a problem. Um, in that year also, Tom Boothby, an undergrad here at UW, added uh, the 3D ray tracer called Tachyon to it, which is a, a C program that is highly parallel. And um, it would let you draw 3D plots of various things, but you had to basically describe your scenes in the language of ray tracing, which got really painful. Um, also, at this time, there were... Uh, Three, there were like ways you could embed 3D graphics for mathematics in web pages using Java applets, but they were all proprietary, like closed source things that we couldn't include with Sage. 
So that was extremely annoying. Like there were a whole bunch of them, but they're all completely closed. Um, and then in 2007, Sage won something called Trophies de Libra, which meant that there were a bunch of articles about Sage all over the world and blog posts about Sage. And the uh, result of the blog posts is I started just searching for them and reading them because it was fun to see what people were saying about Sage. And in one of the blog posts, somebody had a 3D image of a molecule right there in their blog post that was rotating around. And it was really fast, clean, and crisp. And so I was excited. And it turned out it was something called JMOL, which is a 3D uh, molecular visualization library that's used a lot in uh, chemistry teaching. And it, it's kind of weird. So it's a Java applet which doesn't use any 3D acceleration. It just uses 2D Java plotting functions to draw 3D pictures. And um, they solved the problem, at the time at least, of making it so there was a Java applet that would actually work to show 3D for a lot of students. That was their whole goal, to get a Java applet that would actually work and show 3D. Officially, there was some Java 3D support using accelerated 3D graphics, but because of security issues, somehow when you touch the 3D acceleration of a computer, uh, you uh, open up all kinds of subtle security issues. So um, they had to do everything using 2D. Basically, when you tried to install anything that used Java 3D back then, you'd have to click I agree about five times, and it would download megabytes of stuff, and then it wouldn't work. So um, that wasn't so good. So they did everything using 2D, and it was fast enough. And so I figured out how to make it so that you could render all kinds of math objects using this molecular renderer, which was really mainly good at rendering spheres. We got it to render surfaces and everything else. And then Robert Bradshaw and I um, worked a lot in December uh, implementing all the other 3D plotting stuff that I was just showing you. Um, he, did all, he did most of that, or at least a lot of it, um, as well. And then we demoed it at the meetings, and we had a big TV and stuff, so it was great. And then 2008 through 2009, these people, Jason Grout, Robert Bradshaw, Robert Miller, Carl Woody, Bill Caltrace, Josh Cantor, me and others, almost everyone here was a UW grad student or undergrad or nearby person, uh, except Jason basically just wrote all this code and uh, made things faster. And then one thing was that in order to plot, say, a 3D surface, it would have to evaluate the surface, the function that describes the surface at a large number of points. And at the time, that would take a very, very, very long time. So Robert, motivated by 3D plotting, set up the uh, evaluation, and it would make things, in some cases, literally a million times faster, um, which was kind of shocking. Uh, then Bill wrote a a wireframe render using HTML5, um, which was kind of neat, but it was just wireframe versions. And then in 2010, everybody stopped working on 3D graphics in Sage. And basically, nothing has happened at all in 3D graphics. The main thing is that from 2010 through now, the popularity of Java applets in browsers has gone down and down and down. So for example, iPads are now super popular, and they have no Java at all. Android devices, despite everything you write for Android being in Java, in fact, don't run Java applets. So um, Java applets are not very good on any devices. Um, there's an update to OS 10 that's like it's no, it's a security update. It says this update disables Java applet plugin. I mean, but that's a sign. Um, Chromebooks don't have Java, for example, either. So the future is 3JS, which is a JavaScript-based renderer that runs on a very large number of different, um, basically it runs in everything, and it uh, is what we'll be using in Sage in, Sage in the future. Um, if you look at the 3JS website, it's really impressive uh, what you can do on machines that don't have Java applet support. So that uses uh, WebGL, which is accelerated 3D graphics in a browser. And it's definitely the way things are going. And at the workshop, we'll try to update Cloud to use that instead, so you have dynamic graphics again. OK, so I'll see you next week for presentations. Make sure if you're presenting on Monday that you come to class.